forward to the rest of the talk and discussion today. I'm going to talk about soil functions, things that soils do. I'm going to talk about them, about their role within a larger an environmental system at the surface of the earth, what we call the critical zone. And for these pictures on the front page, I want us to think about soil not only for agriculture, but also soils in other types of landscapes, in mountains, uh, not just European soils, but soils in other countries, such as rice paddy terraces in China, or soils that support forests. Soils do many things in addition to growing food. This notion of Earth's critical zone was introduced in 2001. An expert panel from the US National Academies of Science proposed in a research agenda for the new millennium for geosciences that there was a, a, a need for knowledge uh, about Earth's surface. And they turned this zone, the narrow, uh, narrow zone at the surface of the planet from the bedrock to the top of the tree vegetation. They called it the critical zone because it is a critical interface in the functioning of the planet, the interface between the geosphere, between the atmosphere, between the surface waters. But we also know because of this issue of it being natural habitat that determines the availability of life-sustaining resources that there is a very human-centric crisis as well. Our dependence on our need for these resources to live, to support economic development, to address all kinds of political imperatives. But it is the fact that uh, soil is very crucial within this narrow layer of the planet. And introducing this as a topic, as a priority going forward for geosciences research, there was a point also that in terms of a methodology that scientists from many disciplines, from many fields, should work together at specific places, which they term critical zone observatories. You bring together a dominance of expertise from many different fields to come together to co-design research, to, to ask questions together, to make inquiry, to observe, to interpret, and to think about uh, this notion of this critical interface in the planet and how to manage this, this critical need that we have for things that this surface of the planet produces. Critical also because there is an urgency of time. In 2010, the US chief scientific advisor of the government, uh, he conducted what I thought was a very a really interesting and a really simple science communication. He said that humanity is facing a perfect storm. And he said that by 2050, at that time, the projections for world population were 9.3 billion. OECD said that there would be a quadrupling in the global economy by that time. This would lead to a doubling in demand for food and fuel, additional demand for clean water, and that these demands would be, would be needed to be met if we were going to maintain our political systems, maintain our economic systems, maintain civilization, all at a time when climate change is beginning to bite and there would be impacts coming from that. And so people working on soils, we don't invoke pandas in trees or invoke uh, polar bears on ice, chunks of ice, but we can show dust storms approaching in Mali off the southern flank of the Sahara and introduce a very small human figure uh, threatened by such a dust storm. And I got interested to track a little bit some of these measures that this particular scientist introduced at that time. And in the ensuing seven years, the projections for human population have gone up, greenhouse gas levels. Have, uh, their growth in the atmosphere has exceeded. There's certain, you know, sort of um, very psychologically important thresholds like the 400 ppm level for CO2, which has been exceeded. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change says actually we need all this food according to these types of numbers, but the current projections are that agricultural yields will decrease due to declining availability of water due to changing weather patterns over the next decades through the end of the century. And the United Nations Environment Program in seeking what would be reasonable projections of agricultural production, 
their projections are that we will need more than the agricultural uh, environmental capacity of the planet to produce food. And so I conclude over the, since 2010 that the storm is growing in intensity. And again, rather than a dust storm in Mali, growing in intensity, approaching our urban centers. This is a dust storm in Beijing uh, just last month uh, due to desertification in Northwest China and in Mongolia. So soils are under tremendous pressure to <coughs> provide all these things for us. And we need soils in order to address sustainable development goals and economic development. And there's, of the 17 sustainable development goals in the United Nations, and just a few here that are particularly you know, directly linked to soils. But as we put all this increasing pressure on our critical zone and on our soils, you know, we create problems, additional problems. One, of course, is by intensive use of the land. We have the potential, we have a record, a track record as a, as a species of accelerating the movement of soil uh, off of the continents to the oceans. Picture the Mississippi River Delta. Desertification, the loss of organic matter from soil, which has particular problems in terms of helping soil stay in place, helping to build water, helping it support vegetation. And this type of landscape, when you start to lose organic matter, uh, it invokes you know, a very a typical response in many parts of dry lands around the world, which is you have difficulty then supporting biological productivity and supporting vegetation. The loss of soil fertility um, for a variety of reasons, but physical, in terms of uh, evaporative, concentration of salts and irrigation water, physical compaction for machinery on the land surface. We saw sealing of urban areas and also industrial contamination, which impacts the biological vitality of the soil and changing biodiversity. Here's a logging front in the Amazon basin, but I can just as easily, I often show a modern uh, restored tall grass prairie in my native state of Iowa in the USA. Grass two to three meters high when my ancestors came from the Emmental in Switzerland, began to farm there, and now it's monoculture maize soybean and only in a few remote churchyards which have not been plowed up can you find remnants of this tall grass prairie. So why do we think of this, these challenges in terms of Earth's critical zone? It is the, this, this Earth's surface component of the Earth's surface from the bedrock to the atmosphere which hosts soil. And in my thinking, if we're going to solve these problems, we have to think not just of the layer of soil, but how it is connected to other parts of this Earth's surface. And the context here is political. It is in terms of, in this case, EU, policy. Stephen, I think you helped author this thematic strategy. And the European Union decided that we needed to think about protecting the things that soil does for people in order to protect the economic well-being of the Union. Producing food, removing contamination from water so that we have clean rivers, clean aquifers to drink from, providing nutrients to support our Ecosystems support our crops, <coughs> carbon storage so that our CO2 methane doesn't go back into the atmosphere, and supporting biological habitat and the genetic diversity of soils, which are enormous, largely unknown, and we know important and in many ways not sure quite how important. And it is this connectedness that I think is really important and has driven the research that I'm going to, to talk about in the next few slides. It is this notion that this thin surface layer, perhaps a meter or less in thickness, the reason it's so important in terms of the things it does for people is the fact that many of the things we get from soil, we obtain from the effects of soil away from the soil layer. It provides our base flow to rivers, so if we need drinking water from our rivers, you know, this water has passed through the soil layer. If the soil layer is polluted, our drinking water is polluted. If the soil layer is clean, we can remove pollution that enters at the land surface. 
climate change caused by changing the composition of the atmosphere, if we get soil wrong in enough parts of the world, then we know this composition of the atmosphere, CO2 increasing, will affect weather systems and climate everywhere, not just at the point where we are using the soil. So it creates this, it, it, it sets this really wicked problem that it is the diversity of soil, we've seen so much about how it's different in different places, and we've seen how, how different cultures think about soil and use soil, but in aggregate, the, 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 the risks that we face globally depend very much on this aggregate effect of all these different types of soil, different types of cultures, and use of land across the planet. And so it's very patchy. The problem is very patchy. The solutions are probably going to be very patchy, but we have to somehow aggregate them in order to deal with issues like having enough clean water, being able to produce food, and preventing the uh, change in composition of the atmosphere. So we heard about soil aggregates, really important. Um, in Russian soil science, there is an empirical rule that if we have more than 60% of the dry mass of soil in particles that are greater than 0.25 millimeters, you have good soil. And if you're a farmer, you talk about the crumb of the soil. And this type of soil correlates also to very dark soil. And you know it correlates with a lot of organic matter. So we think about building soil aggregates. We saw a similar uh, a picture, I think it was from Kate's talk yesterday, where plant matter enters the soil and this is a source of carbon and energy, and we have microorganisms that decompose this plant matter, and as they do so, they produce colonies of organisms that grow and thrive on this material. There's extracellular chemistry which occurs, which allows other aggregates to pull together, and you form these larger aggregates. And as this organic matter is decomposed, used up, then these can fall and break apart. So we think about how to do calculations about these things, and this is where how I think about soil in terms of how you can represent what soil is, deconstructing it in different ways and applying mathematical representations to the things that are happening in soil. So this is a little network of what happens when plant litter enters soil, and we think of soil in different size classifications, less than 53 microns, a clay-sized particle, or a silt-sized particle, 53 to 250 microns, or large, greater than 250 microns. And these smaller particles can stick together inside the larger particles. And it turns out that this golden aggregate really is as we put plant matter into the soil, it drives the formation of these larger aggregates, and that correlates with rapid decomposition of this plant matter and release of organic nitrogen and phosphorus to nourish the ecosystem. And so all of these circles represent a mass of certain size of particles, and the arrows represent the flow of carbon into these. And we can apply mathematical rules to do calculations on those. And we can embed those type of calculations within, here we show the atmospheric boundary layer, top of the tree canopy, the soil layer, the bottom of the soil, the water table, below it, the bedrock. You can put conservation laws, conservation of mass and energy. And you can build this kind of representations of soil aggregate formation into calculations that calculate the flow and the transformation of all this material within soil and how it's connected to these other layers of the critical zone. And you can connect in a kind of cascade of computer calculations these different parts of the system and have them talk to each other. And that is another way of how one scientific community <coughs> thinks about soil, breaking it down into individual things which then are represented in mathematics and we do calculations. So we've done calculations on horticulture experiments. We measure things about the soil. These are tomato experiments. Um, my colleague, Nick Nicolaides, who operates a critical zone observatory on the island of Crete, carried out this work and developed this mathematical modeling computer code. And you can do calculations. This is the dynamic vegetation model. It shows how the tomato plants grow during the season, the dark, wedges that are poking up, 
And the shaded areas in between, in between are the weeds, which grow during the off season when you're not growing tomatoes. And through this cascade of calculations, you can also look at things of how the soil carbon behaves. So this is the amount of soil organic carbon, units of tons per hectare, over a four-month time period of experiment and simulation. You can see it declines slightly over time, and this is using mineral fertilizer to grow these tomatoes, or we can compost with municipal waste and manure, and it shows that these annual inputs of compost increase the soil organic matter. And we can look at how this organic matter is distributed within the small particles, the medium particles, and the large particles. And so this is another approach to studying soil in this way with observations and mathematics. And in terms of speaking to people of the European Commission, they like to understand the economics of the soil system. And so they think of soils as being an endowment. Well, this is one way to represent it to them. Our ecological economists can say, it's an endowment we receive from a critical zone. We benefit from it over time, but if we degrade these soil functions, this is the same thing as spending the money of our fund, and so our income we get from it over time is less. And you can do monetization. Now, it's a communication tool. Some people find it really offensive. I think it's quite interesting to think about different ways to try to understand market and non-market value of, of soils. But the important thing right here is we cannot put a price easily on climate regulation, but you can cost it if you look at carbon prices on the current market. And you'll see for Crete it's negative, and this is because Crete is losing carbon, soil organic matter. And if you apply accountancy rules to it, that translates into some concept of a loss in value. So my final slide, the question is, if you put all this amount of mathematics together into a computer code, so maybe this is the inner part of my talk. You have the personal crisis at times. Well, this is all very interesting. We can do this. It's a great trick. We can make computer code that calculates interesting things that we can compare it to measurements we make in the field. And I think maybe it's like Dr. Johnson's dog. It walks on its hind legs, um, which is not a particularly interesting outcome given how much time you may have spent teaching the dog to walk. But then when we compare it to the pressing challenges that we have, there is a need to get on. And so we go to work with colleagues in places like China who have really pressing environmental problems associated with food production. And we press on and try to do better models. We try to make the dog walk better. We had, I think, back two years ago, because mm. um, you were talking about the critical zone observatories being um, spaces for collaboration between different sciences and an integration. Um, and you mentioned then to me a one critical zone observatory, which was also seeking to integrate local knowledge and the community that is living in this critical zone observatory in Greece. And I was wondering if you could say a few words about that and also tell us whether that's very unusual or not. It, it is very unusual, and I think it also shows, I think also a little bit, the, the, the influence of individual characters. Now, Professor Nicolaides, some of you know him, <laughs> and Stephen Laps, he was an advisor to the project, and Nick is a, is a very engaging individual, and he went into this river basin, and he you know, established personal friendships with, I swear, every single inhabitant of every single village in the river basin. And when we go there, they come around with us and look at the tomato experiments. They think about how they might do that on their farms. They go and talk about it in their village meetings. And Crete is not only under huge you know, climate pressure, climate change pressure, it's under huge economic pressure for agriculture. And so it's an example. It grew organically out of the, the individual personalities that were engaged with this. But to me, this is a tremendous model. 
I mean, the, the, the inhabitants of the river basin feel ownership of this observatory. They enjoy the university coming out. They love meeting people who come from all over the world to come and look at their river basin. It's fantastic. And to me, it's a model of how you can really engage in co-design and co-delivery and, and get co-ownership of, of the, uh, the science that you're doing. And it's very cool.